in Vegas, I eat strawberries. Big, ripe, swollen with their own goodness. Yogurt bays and swirls, milk cradles, the glass fruit as 10,000 air conditioners hum the great strawberries move their wide hips into my spoon. With redness sexed white, thick milk stopped cool and each nipple their scent makes repentance. They are goodness and pleasure and loud coins jingling through the long slots of ch -ch -ch, Las Vegas. Their carpet, red carpet, kissing at each shoe. Strawberries in Vegas on tall parfait thrones, bought in by a call. Justin from like uh, invitation only, the guy that throws these major dinner parties in these little unusual places all through town. He said, I'm coming, do the food stuff. So and of course he's not here. <laughs> so. Nazi youth in Bruges. Oh honey, you know what? I'm gonna do another poem before that. Yeah. The Germans were good to her giving potato peelings and walking on softened heels and falling in love many times with menless death. She took on soldiers, rode her bike right to the front, gave up blood sausage during the war and traveled far those five years. Now Sophie, enameled mirrors and a wide driveway in the suburbs, the backyard willow outgains the yard. To you, every wind means a mess. But remember long candles in the night. Remember sharp symbols carving beneath, beneath your dress. Remember swans tense as angels breaking glass on food truck ponds. And the smell, not too far off, of tallowed flesh and hooks like mysteries in the dark. Dear Sophie, I have to join the war. It cannot last. The child will be a boy. I just know it. Dear Dutch girl, swollen with war and big German stock, now two-car barrage. When they first landed, it was scoops of fire dancing in darkness, parachutes mauling what was left of moonlight and fresh radish sandwiches, and hymens in girls over 13 or 11. Mm. Some were hung on prey hoists. Some fell into chest-deep ovens. And others now call from their purring Plymouths. The garage door falls onto rakes and lawn chairs and swallows in dark a most perfect neatness. This is actually about my mother. So interesting. Nazi youth in Bruges. The same beautiful hands. Now this sounds really loud, doesn't it? The same beautiful hands, brick blade in love with brick. The same paintbrushes that wash the trim blue, pulsing blue Belgium sky pumping across Europe. That same carefully dug rose that lifts his head into mourning, its delicate neck wired by gossamer. <coughs> that same gossamer that weaves itself into blossoms, dense, accrue lace woven by Flemish women, their fingers knotted with years and love of texture. Their husbands at home in the field, 
making indelible patterns in the earth, that same earth that sprouts houses and brick barns, the color of fire, the color of poppies, strayed and spotty in the canal banks, and cows catching sunlight in their flanks. That color that dissolves into concrete Stray bunkers remaining from World War II, dense and sprouting hair of long wheat in wild roses, which, upon going into, requires the parting of alfalfa clouds the color of bruises and thistles that brush the udders of cows. Then, the walking into darkness, stained by piss, and ancient doings of darkness. While outside, hawks throw themselves into sky and one chestnut cow mounts another. The same hands that pull the udders, the beautiful giving udders, lay brick that hug mortar for centuries, drop wheat kernels in furrows deep as milk, then wipe sweat from brows. These hands that roll the nipples of lovers, of pale girlfriends, of wives, still dipped in darkness, mark these walls. The symbol of lightning gone wrong. Without children grow orchids whose fuchsia and lips hang down with spittle, the very tips of fragrant vowels. These women hold flower sickles near waters and they bathe them with mists. They do not wipe at mouths that are always open and slightly obscene. They do not avoid the newborn displaying his sexual parts. No, women herd the stamens and sticky pistons into the pots, and then let them rant free and reckless in front of company. They imagine the instruments of drunken bees as they stagger up from their drop to amber, and they worship magenta. Women without children lift the tendrils and shiny rhizomes, pearlish as boy cocks, and feed them to the bark moist, crumbling, fragrant to the touch. They stroke green pseudobobes and veer toward yellow. They lay at night dreaming of more damp mouths to feed whose tiny tendrils tumble toward water, whose sticky sneeze leave the kerchief coral, a million minute dots whose sneeze burst forth her touch. Nice. I love them orchids. <laughs> All right. This is dedicated to um, this is dedicated to my mother in memory of Sitska Sophia Howard, and it's it's for little Grace. The way. Lavender spears sunlight, just as poppies bend and fold into scarlet skirts. It's the way shadow signals inch by inch the spreading chill of darkness across the hill. It is the way as you laid in my arms, your body pink cocooned within your newborn blanket, that you reminded me of her, six months gone, laying within the hospice comforter, swimming that long swim from shore to shore, the whole of life's dreams that must be crossed, children pensive at the edge. How you have arrived, your own deep swim, arduous and taxing, your small pursed lips at last relaxing, just as she has crossed the other side. Rehabilitation, how 
hummingbirds adjust their natal noses toward the feeder's small, precise angled slim air. I lower my mother to the stair, her small body taking, her small body shaking still from taking steps, small motions tacked to air. We are peaks among the hummingbirds whose sonic zipping miss our hair and bring down dusk in nets of rose and silver. She is a child that I bring outside to stare at her future in a cloud, to sniff her history from a tipping tulip, to be among the hummingbirds and know there will be peace. is sitting at a hospice bed, genuflecting to death to make it easier on her, and to not screw around or play games as death is prone to do, and to not have all her sisters, her nieces, her stepdaughters drive in from out of town and then decide that she is not that desirable anymore, though she has prayed to him, has stopped medication, has given up her earrings, her small shoppings, spoons of ice cream, even speaking to be his bride. Death is a bastard on thinking. After all the sisters, the nieces, the stepdaughters have gone back home, and although he loves it, he will not perform for audiences. So I wait, her breathing shallow, Release her hand, because I know that death will not share her. And I lay beside her in a hospice pull-out chair. I know that this is normal. And I think about how Dawn is struggling just to be born. And this is going to happen again and again in some hook through the gut way. So I think, stay elusive through the probing, through the ultrasound, the MRI, because death is a wicked dude. He either wants you or he don't. Mm. It has nothing, I mean nothing, to do with you. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. All right, so my dad was a hellraiser when he was a kid, and he used to ride motorcycles down on Redwood Road when Redwood Road was dirt. So cops used to chase him. He, he, I have a, uh, an article out of the newspaper that says, 19-year-old out chases policemen till takes the turn in Liberty Parks, refuses to go to the hospital, and so he ended up going to jail at 19 years old for, you know, right away from cops. He used to race motorcycles. He collected them, and in his, you know, as his uh, suburban life with three daughters, he collected antique motorcycles. So he was a, an Indian maniac. He loved Indians. And when, you know, Harley Davidson came and made their scene, my dad used to call them Harley Abelsons, because there was that rivalry between Indians and Harleys. So uh, my father had this old 39 Harley. I mean, excuse me, Indian, not a Harley. Although he did have some Harleys, but he had an old 39 Indian that he loved, he cherished. And this um, poem is about that Indian motorcycle from my father, Robert M. Howard. When you sell the Indian, I am away in a hotel in Denver, and the news shoots like electroshocks through the mouths of our family. Because when you sell the Indian, despite the plea my husband made of you before we left, rumors of it running through as if we were losing not just you, but the past of you. 
the boy running skinny on the west side of Salt Lake, the you of you that cried in boy terror as great schoolmates trailed your way, the slip of you being bloodied at the porch step, almost making it in. The almost of you, always a dad that picks you up and throws you back out to be a man, to be a man, to be a man. It's not the machine that we are losing, old and graced, still kicks up in the garage, but the grace of you sliding lightly across the gym floor, arms adjusted like tuned pistons, punching light into your foe. It is the blonde hair of you smashing waves into the sky, the nuts and bolts of you greased and snarled and glistening gears that ache for more. It is the zen of you, tight and tuned and loose with liquor, Kissing fear right on the smacker. It <laughs> is the girl of you. So tight in man skin, mirrored by daughters and a feisty wife. The mother of you, curled like a brooch pin within your gut, her pale blue house dress, her eyes of water, her breath still titted with hints of rose. When you sell the Indian, you sell the promise that you'll go on. That thoughts won't slip by, silver trout, darting lightning behind words. That you won't wander through the house, searching, searching all night long, losing the it of things, of names, of places, of checks you wrote. When you sell the Indian, that which is Precious spokes and leather, aging chrome still shiny in the garage. You forget that night. With me, the daughter, frantically trying to get it back. I got it. <laughs> it's in my garage, damn it. <laughs> Some of you guys can relate to this. When Joe eats honey, the harvest sits dark and brooding in plastic pails. Water rushes up hot and hurried and light melts downward into the cleavage of mountains. This fuel of August, um, um, oh, this fuel of August, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This fuel of August, unsealed by hot knives, oozes visceral from milk, skin, cells, then runs like summer in great globs of gold. It's like watching day drop in night's black boil, hmm. nectar swimming along the edges. It's like the musk of lavender, of sagebrush, of rabbit brush whose punted yellow draws flies as well, rising as the sky turns mad and bronze tooth onto a cloud. Joe's Hall, this thievery of bees and spittle, whip of queen and brush of genitals, fragrance filled, runs, sweet vapors lacquering our halls, down Joe's sieves, slow, Deliberate, the drain of days now gone. Oh, that is so good. Ah, this makes me hungry too. This poem. The eating of muscles becomes a feast of small openings. The fragrant fishing up from broth, the gentle sliding of fork between. Then the prying forth, a pause, a glimpse of copper flesh, coin fed by sea, a pearl, a life, 
A whiff of steam escapes from onyx petals, mollusk lift against all thieves, slippery fingers, tarragon seeped and spiked by saffron, drop again into the bowl, the chime like china of empty shells, till few remain immersed in wine, their clamp and death unbroken. Damn, and I try to get off of them. <laughs> anyway, I love it. All right, I have another food poem, and then it's right back to sex, and I'm done. <laughs> so, Rosie's Diner, when um, the first conference that New Orleans had after Katrina, only there were only a few hotels that were really functioning, there were a few restaurants, and they, they held this big realtors conference. Um, Bourbon Street wasn't open, the French Quarter wasn't open, there, you know, there were places that were boarded up. It was just the saddest, freakiest thing. It was so surreal. Um, and and we, were, we were there. We were, you know, acting like this is normal, this is the conference. And um, this is me trying to get a meal at Rosie's Diner. At Rosie's Diner, it's sorry ma'am, sorry, floating pork grease in the air. Dark-haired mahogany night, slips on countertops, Louisiana style. Clock knocked up with neon says, order's been taken too long, too long. With a cashier jamming, computer screen, shoot, shoot. Her smoky fingers stab at sleep. Home cooking on Ohio boys' mind as the fatality of orders now taking near midnight taps upon the cigarette carton laying next to car keys. Young man in the kitchen has no teeth. Her lips mesmerize air as it slides damp and deep while she sorry sorries through her shift. If I ever will get fed immaterial on this deep New Orleans night. <coughs> This is, uh, this is my signature, so here you go, guys. And might as well just get the whole theme, right? Like deer caught in headlights, the young whores on Vita Cassine turn. Their eyes flash the white of small pressed flowers. Their breasts push upward into the mouths of street lights as each new car slows almost to a stop. With cars still with heat stone. Leave this. <laughs> there you go. With fire still burning, three millimeters hot above her hemline, where the man in the Peugeot has just pulled out. She walks quickly, panties in hand, to the next car. Her bare ass, exposed like the young face of a sleeper child catches our headlights before dropping down into the darkness of a bucket seat. Across the bridge, the white Firenze moon hand strokes the genitals of Chianti grapevines. Blessed Salvadorica, whose hills soak in milk of spilled moonlight, whose luna lay straights each stirred stocking like the twice washed stockings of a 17-year-old Donno, quanto, quanto. Each girl like a statue the Medici have commissioned, glass <laughs> eye virgins carved with boots to their sides, boots to their thighs, turn and look, then bend down all along Cassini Park, where Donatello knelt each daybreak. Jesse's going to come up and he's going to blow all of our bodies out through that window. So, <laughs> so Jesse, so here's the deal, you guys. They do, they go to the slam and they compete again. I mean, this is the national slam right, where people send from all over the nation. Every city sends one or two teams. New York, everybody. And um, these guys kick butt. I mean, Salt Lake City kicks butt. That's a huge, huge deal. So he can tell a little bit about the team afterwards. But Jesse, our our own Jesse, there's an individual slam champ team. That's for one person. 
the most powerful slammer of them all. And they compete, and it's called the Slam Champ of the World. And Jesse ranked two in the whole nation. So you know, now he's got to do one. But you know, that's that's a really big deal. So no pressure, Jesse. Right. Thank you very much.